Sure. We are now in week 14. I can't believe it. Um, it's kind of stunning. But here we are. And I want to finish up on sustainable development. And I want to do it by discussing um, one topic, uh, which is the encyclical Laudato Si of Post Pope Francis, which was released in 2015. It's called Laudato Si on Care for Our Common Home. And this is a very important encyclical. It's a, it's a remarkable document. It's unprecedented in the history of the Catholic Church. Um, it was timed to influence both the adoption of the SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, as, uh, as Jeff mentioned on Tuesday, um, at the session at the United Nations in September 1915, which endorsed the SDGs, the opening address was given by Pope Francis. He was actually in the United Nations on his US trip in September 1915. And I want to argue that Laudato Si is a moral charter for sustainable development. Uh, it's an extremely uh, remarkable document. Let's just go, and, and I will, all, I, all I want to do this morning is go through it. It won't take the full class, but that's fine. We'll go as long as we need, and then we'll take some, we can have a discussion. We can take some questions. But um, let's begin. Um, he begins by arguing that, and, we'll, and it starts with, don't worry, he starts with the kind of the religion and the theology, but gets very quickly into very practical things related to um, uh, climate change and other environmental issues. And he argues that the earth is like our mother or our sister. He uses the spirituality of St. Francis of Assisi. And I'll just read this quote because this is how he opens it. The, the sis, this sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her. We have come to see ourselves as her lords and masters entitled to plunder her at will. The violence present in our hearts, wounded by sin, is also reflected in the symptoms of sickness evident in the soil, in the water, in the air, and in all forms of life. This is why the earth herself, burdened and laid waste, is among the most abandoned and maltreated of our poor. She groans in travail. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air and we receive life and refreshment from her waters. We are part of nature. That's the, one of the principles of Catholic social teaching, which I mentioned way back in week five, I think it was, which is called integral ecology the notion that human beings and the earth are deeply, deeply connected to each other. And when we hurt one, we hurt another. So when we hurt the earth, we not only do something wrong in itself, but we actually hurt human beings. We take a dagger against sustainable development. Um, the, Pope Francis argues that Christianity has used the idea that human beings are to exercise dominion over nature in an irresponsible and false way. He says that we, um, the idea is not so much dominion, but to till and to keep, to till the earth and to keep the earth. But if humanity tills too much and keeps too little, then the natural harmony is disrupted. Uh, and also remember here that each creature has its own value, purpose, destiny. We are pr to protect the earth and everything on it for future generations. He notes that I didn't put this quote up, but it's, each community can take from the bounty of the earth whatever it needs for subsistence, but it also has the duty to protect the earth and to ensure its fruitfulness for coming generations. So in other words, in a term that I, that I like a lot, the earth is not just a legacy from our parents. It is a loan from our children. 
And this is the kind of intergenerational solidarity we are supposed to exercise to protect the earth and the fruits of creation. There's a mystical vision here. Um, it's actually a beautiful document that mixes mysticism, spirituality, and very practical advice, as we'll see on climate change and issues like that. But I think this is a beautiful quote. I wanted to put this up here. The entire material universe speaks of God's love, his boundless affection for us all, soil, water, mountains, everything is, as it were, a caress of God. That's a beautiful quote, isn't it? And there are plenty of other quotes like that in Laudato Si, which, by the way, I encourage everybody to read. Uh, it's a profound uh, document. And it's infused also, this mystical vision is infused with the spirituality of St. Francis of Assisi. Again, like one point he writes, everything is related and we human beings are united as brothers and sisters on a wonderful pilgrimage woven together by the love God has for each of his creatures and which also unites us in fond affection with brother sun, sister moon, brother river, and mother earth. Um, profoundly beautiful meditation there. So following this um, theological discourse, this spiritual discourse, he moves into very practical issues as to what is wrong, what's happening to our common home. And I want to start here by talking about the planetary boundaries. This is, this is a scientific um, um, excursus of the various environmental problems that are facing the earth. Um, and there are nine such planetary boundaries, uh, the boundaries that create a safe operating system for us to thrive and flourish on this planet. And when we violate these boundaries, bad things can happen. We undermine the conditions for our own flourishing. Um, so there are nine boundaries. The first and probably the most important is climate change, which is caused by burning fossil fuels. The second is ocean acidification, which is related to climate change. The third is the overuse of freshwater resources. Um, water shortage uh, has the potential to be a major crisis in the years and decades ahead. The fourth is land use changes. That's chiefly related to deforestation. And we can see this in places like the Amazon um, in a very um, dangerous way. Um, the fifth is the interference with the nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, and that's caused mainly by the use of fertilizers. These cause all kinds of uh, pollution, um, which runs into our water and uh, can poison the earth. Um, the sixth is ozone depletion, that protective ozone layer that protects us from dangerous um, uh, effects from um, uh, the, 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 uh, the atmosphere uh, caused by the industrial chemicals, which erodes a protective barrier in the upper, upper atmosphere, as I, as I, as I mentioned. Uh, and then back in the 1980s, early 1990s, there was a, a, an effort to stop the ozone depletion, which uh, because they found a hole in the ozone layer which eroded that protective barrier. The seventh is chemical pollution. The eighth is called aerosol loading, which is really airborne pollution caused by burning fossil fuels. And if you ever spend a, a winter in a city like Beijing or Delhi, um, the inhabitants of those cities often face terrible pollution, which causes so much death and uh, ill health every year from burning fossil fuels, chiefly coal. And the ninth of the planetary boundaries is the loss of biodiversity in the context of ruptured ecosystems. Um, some people say we are facing the sixth mass extinction, the only extinction that has been caused by human activity. Uh, all the previous extinctions were caused by natural forces um, uh, to the earth. Oh, so there are the nine planetary boundaries that the scientists tell us 
form a kind of the safe operating system which in which we live. And there is a, a graph of what the planetary boundaries look like and how close we are to, um, to violating those boundaries. Uh, some of them are very difficult to measure. Uh, some of them are, you know, we can uh, measure them better than others. But basically in all cases, if we violate these planetary boundaries, we leave behind this 10,000 year period known as the Holocene, this period of climatic stability, this period that led to human civilization and flourishing to move into the Anthropocene, which is a new geological epoch, which is caused for the first time ever by human activity with unknown and probably dangerous consequences. So that's the risk that we all face. Now, getting back to the Dato C, the Pope Francis does not use the term planetary boundaries. And yet he discusses these issues in great detail when he talks about what is wrong with our common home. So it goes way beyond. Some people say this encyclical is on climate change. It goes way beyond that. It's actually a holistic and a remarkably scientifically accurate description as to what is wrong with our common home today. He, st he talks about pollution. The earth or home is beginning to look more and more like an immense pile of filth. That's a kind of a remarkable statement for a, a church document. There are very few uh, papal encyclicals that use terms like pile of filth. Um, but uh, it's very blunt and it's very clear and it's very accurate. Um, turning to climate change, Pope Francis affirms the solid scientific consensus that the earth is warming and that this is due to the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And that's mainly as a result of human activity. And uh, as always with integral ecology, you have to look at the relationship between the human person and the earth. And here the poor are especially vulnerable to the effects of climate change because the poor live in areas most directly affected by climate change. They rely on livelihoods most vulnerable to climate change and they lack the resources and support necessary to cope with the disruption brought about by climate change. And this is very important for Pope Francis, who is very uh, deeply connected to um, the condition of the poor in the world. Um, turning to water, the Pope argues that access to safe, drinkable water is a basic and universal human right, since it is essential for human survival, and as such is a condition for the exercise of other human rights. Um, Professor Sachs on Tuesday talked about the centrality of economic rights to sustainable development. And Pope Francis here is affirming that the right to water is one of those central uh, human rights. And because it is so, so essential for life, uh, there, it's one, there are very few rights that you can say are more important than it. And of course, water poverty is a major problem in places like Africa, where people lack access to safe drinking water, and they also live in areas prone to droughts that hurt agricultural productivity and human well being. Biodiversity um, the Pope spends a lot of time discussing uh, biodiversity um, and all the areas that are at risk, especially the tropical forests in the Amazon, in the Congo Basin, in the Indonesian archipelago. Um, deforestation is bringing about terrible losses of biodiversity. And this is where he has this other very profound quote. Uh, he says, because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. We have no such right. So that's a, a very strong statement, but I, and a very profound statement uh, uh, on the loss of biodiversity. Let's move on to the moral diagnosis of Laudato Si. So 
after describing what is wrong with our common home, what's the state of our common home, he asks why. Why are we in this state? Why are we treating the earth in a way like this? And here in a, in a reflection that will resonate deeply with this course, with this class, that given what we've been talking about for the last 14 weeks, he criticizes what he calls the myths of modernity grounded in a utilitarian mindset, individualism, unlimited progress, competition, consumerism, and the unregulated market. So you can think in one sense that this course is a, is a response to Pope Francis's criticism uh, of the modern global economy. And indeed, even though he doesn't mention it, of how economics and business is taught and propagated throughout society. So he talks about what he calls the technocratic paradigm as at the root of, uh, of, these, of these flaws in the modern economy. The technocratic paradigm invites us to think of all economic intervention, of all economic activity, solely in terms of utility, productivity, and efficiency. Um, it negates any inherent dignity or value in either the human being or in creation. And it leads to a focus on endless economic growth, regardless of the implications of that endless economic growth for our common home, for the environment, for ecology, for integral ecology, for, uh, and the human flourishing that results from that. So that's the technocratic paradigm. This is an inherently confrontational vision. It exalts human power and it embraces a ethos of what the Pope calls possession, mastery, and transformation. Nature is there to be possessed, to be mastered, and to be transformed in any way you like. This is what he calls modern anthropocentrism, that we are the center of the universe and, the, and nature is there for us to exploit. So in a sense, this technocratic paradigm, which leads to modern anthropocentrism, looks upon creation as an external object to be manipulated and controlled. It denies the idea of integral ecology, that we are part of nature, and uh, completely connected to it, and our fates are intertwined. Um, he talks about that this leads to what he calls practical relativism, um, when the, that, that is when the technocratic paradigm is attached to this cult of unlimited human power. The result is a, quote, relativism, which sees everything as irrelevant unless it serves one's own immediate interests. And that should sound familiar because it kind of describes what is wrong with how economics and business is often practiced today. It's all about your own interest. It gives absolute priority to immediate convenience and driving people to treat their fellow human beings and indeed all of creation as mere objects to be taken advantage of. And... Um, it's all about the self. So it's me, 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 instead of we, we, we. And remember, the common good is always about the we rather than the me. Whereas the libertarian mentality of, of modern economics is definitely about the me. So the Pope criticizes the focus on the self. He calls it self-centeredness, self-absorption and a self-centered centered culture of instant gratification. And because of all of this, he gives another profound quote, which is that immense technological development. And we talked a lot a couple of weeks ago about technological development and how powerful it is and how much and how it has a great potential to do good. But, but this immense technological development has not been accompanied by a development in human responsibility, values, and conscience. We leave the ethics behind. 
unfortunately. Okay. This gives rise, I want to talk about Pope Francis's criticism of the market economy. Remember when Professor Sachs talked about sustainable development, he started by saying that the free market cannot bring about sustainable development on its own. And Pope Francis starts with his signature diagnosis, which is the throwaway culture. The throwaway culture says that both people and things are used to satisfy gratification and then they're simply discarded when they serve no further use. He argues that the excluded are no longer even part of society. They're outside of society. And here's the quote, those excluded are no longer society's underside or its fringers or its disenfranchised. They are no longer even a part of it. And Pope Francis, remember, comes from Latin America. He comes from a part of the world where there's immense inequality and the poor, the large masses of the poor are really excluded from the economy and from society. And people just like to pretend that they don't exist because their existence uh, pricks the conscience of people. So they're excluded from society in this throwaway culture or the culture of waste as it's often translated. So the Pope then condemns not just the market because markets are natural, but he condemns the ideology that surrounds the market, what he calls a deified market or a magical conception of the market. The idea that the market itself can bring about all these wonderful things that goes back to Adam Smith and his in invisible hand. Um, the Pope is actually rejecting this Adam Smith view that self-interest serves the common good. He calls it a seedbed for collective selfishness. Um, so he goes to, he criticizes this Adam Smith idea of the invisible hand directly. He also criticizes the idea of trickle down economics, the idea that if you help the rich, then that will trickle down and help the poor. And it's worth quoting what he says there in some detail. He says, in this context, some people continue to defend trickle down theories, which assume that economic growth encouraged by a free market will inevitably succeed in bringing about greater justice and inclusiveness in the world. This opinion, which has never been confirmed by the facts, that is true, expresses a crude and naive trust in the goodness of those wielding economic power and in the sacralized workings of the prevailing economic system. Meanwhile, the excluded are still waiting. I think that's a profound indictment of much of our modern economic system and how we view the economy. Now in 2020, Pope Francis issued a new encyclical called Fratelli Tutti, which is about universal human brotherhood, uh, especially between religions. Um, but he also criticized trickle down in very strong terms there. And I wanna read you this as well, because it's related and it's a more recent indictment. The marketplace by itself cannot resolve every problem. There is sustainable development. However much we are asked to believe this dogma of neoliberal faith, whatever the challenge, this impoverished and repetitive school of thought always offers the same recipes. Neoliberalism simply reproduces itself by resorting to magic theories of spillover or trickle without using the name as the only solution to societal problems. There is little appreciation of the fact that the alleged spillover does not resolve the inequality that gives rise to new forms of violence threatening the fabric of society. Again, a profound indictment of neoliberalism and trickle-down economics, the idea that the market can solve all the economic problems and the government just has to stay on the sidelines and not intervene too much. And this leads to, I call it strong words, uh, in a speech in Peru in 2015, uh, a remarkable speech to uh, the group called the Popular Movements, 
a group of the poor people seeking to be active agent, uh, agents of their own development. He says, let us say no to an economy of exclusion and inequality where money rules rather than serves. That economy kills, that economy excludes, that economy destroys Mother Earth. So very strong indictment of the modern economy there by Pope Francis. So that's his um, diagnosis as to why we are where we are today. So the next question then is, what do we do about it? What are the solutions? Well, he calls for a, a different kind of progress, one that is healthier, more human, more social, more integral. And that will involve a lot less consumerism. Um, he, at one point, he criticizes a whirlwind of needless buying and selling, too much consumerism, not enough investment in the future in sustainable development. Um, he refers to the three L's, the three rights of land, labor, lodging. This sounds better in Spanish where it's three T's. And since I speak very bad Spanish, I'm not going to try and say it, but um, it's land, labor, lodging. And these are the rights that Pope Francis says every single person has to land, to labor, in other words, to work and to lodging, to housing. Um, and he refers to then what, he, what we need, he says, is integral and sustainable human development. Remember when we did the class on Catholic social teaching, integral human development is the good of all people and the whole person. Uh, you can't exclude anybody, it's all people, and you can't exclude any dimension. It's the development of the whole person, not just the economic side, but the whole person. And of course, sustainable development, we, we know what that is because you had a full class from Professor Sachs on that. Um, but Pope Francis basically defines sustainable development uh, very succinctly when he says we need an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time, protecting nature. There are your three legs of sustainable development. And of course, as we noticed, he endorsed the sustainable development goals at the United Nations in 2015. So that's the kind of different kind of progress he's asking for. Uh, integral, the punchline is integral and sustainable human development. Now, when we talk about solutions, he breaks it down into individual solutions and collective or societal solutions. So the individual solutions, he calls for enhanced virtue. And this gets back to the old Arist our, our old friend Aristotle, our old friend Thomas Aquinas. He calls for new sets of ecological virtues, what he calls ecological conversion or ecological citizenship. And remember, a virtue is a good habit that can only be perfected by practice. And these efforts can be small, but as Pope Francis notes, they are nonetheless worthwhile. They allow people to live more fulfilled lives, and they, they quote, call forth a goodness which, albeit unseen, inevitably tends to spread. In other words, virtue can be infectious. If people start acting how, through this ecological conversion and developing these ecological virtues, then this will spread and this, this goodness will spread. Um, he lists um, what he calls small daily actions, um, which can develop this ecological virtue. So avoiding the use of plastic and paper, reducing water consumption, separating refuse, cooking only what can be reasonably consumed, showing care for other living beings, using public transport or carpooling, planting trees, turning off unnecessary lights or any other number of other practices. Um, these are all 
individual solutions that we can all do in our daily lives to develop ecological virtue, ecological citizenship. But, and a very big but, individual solutions are not enough. Pope Francis says that self-improvement on the part of individuals will not by itself remedy the extremely complex situation facing our world today. So we also need institutional solutions. We need not just individual conversion, but we need community conversion. We need societal conversion. And the starting point there is to recognize that, as, as, uh, and this is Professor Sachs um, made this point, that we have interdependence obliges us to think of one world with a common plan. And that common plan are the SDGs and also the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. And the Paris Agreement says we want to stop the rise in global average temperatures to 2 degrees or better yet 1.5 degrees Celsius. So it says you want to peak global emissions as soon as possible with the goal of reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the second half of the century. And as Professor Sachs says, we need net zero by 2050. That's only 30 years away. We have to completely transform the energy system uh, in 30 years. It's an, uh, it's an unbelievably complicated technical and financial um, challenge. Uh, yet we have the technical and financial ability to do it. What we lack is the moral and political will to do it. And this is where Pope Francis comes in. This is where we need this institutional change and community conversion. So he says, the Pope says that we need decarbonization, um, technology based on the use of highly polluting fossil fuels, especially coal, but also oil, and to a lesser degree gas, needs to be progressively replaced without delay. And in this process of decarbonization, uh, this move towards a net zero carbon economy, um, he also calls for financial and technical help for the poorer countries. Uh, because again, this is part of one world with a common plan. Climate and environmental problems do not respect national borders. We are all in this together. Um, now, the problem is the power of very strong domestic interests. Um, the environmental activist Bill McKibben has argued that using the math of carbon budgets, that 80% 80 80 of all the oil, coal, and gas reserves on the books of fossil fuel companies need to be kept in the ground if we have any chance of meeting our climate goals. 80% of all assets should not be burned need to be kept in the ground. That's a lot of money. It's something like $20 trillion in assets. So obviously the fossil fuel companies are going to be, are going to oppose this because they're going to lose money. And Pope Francis is well aware of this. He argues that there are too many special interests and economic interests easily end up trumping the common good and manipulated, manipulating information so that their own plans will not be affected. Manipulating information. There you have climate change denialism and all kinds of fossil fuel uh, funded misinformation uh, to stop the decarbonization, to stop the, the climate transition. He also says that many of those who possess more resources and economic or political power seem mostly to be concerned with, and here's the punchline, masking the problems or concealing their symptoms. So strong power of vested interests that need to be overcome before we uh, take this collective journey towards a zero carbon economy. Here's a big quote, but I thought it was useful to show it to you. In 2018, a bunch of oil company executives went to the Vatican and Pope Francis gave a speech to them and he did not hold back. 
Uh, I'm going to read this to you because I think it's important. Uh, and keep in mind that the CEOs of the major fossil fuel companies were in the room when he said this. If we are to eliminate poverty and hunger, as called for by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the more than, the more than 1 billion people without electricity today need to gain access to it. But that energy should be clean by a reduction in the systematic use of fossil fuels. Our desire to ensure energy for all must not lead to the undesired effect of a spiral of extreme climate changes due to a catastrophic rise in global temperatures, harsher environments, and increased levels of poverty. As you know, in December 2015, 196 nations negotiated and adopted the Paris Agreement with a firm resolve to limit the growth in global warming, warming to below 2 degrees centigrade based on pre-industrial levels, and if possible, to below 1.5 degrees centigrade. Some two and a half years later, carbon dioxide emissions and atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases remain very high. This is disturbing and a real cause for concern. Yet even more worrying is the continued search for new fossil fuel reserves, whereas the Paris Agreement clearly urged keeping most fossil fuels underground. This is why we need to talk together, industry, investors, researchers, and consumers about transition and the search for alternatives. Civilization requires energy, but energy must not destroy civilization. I'll repeat that final line because it's so powerful. Civilization requires energy, but energy must not destroy civilization. So what else can we do according to Pope Francis? Um, he argues that civil society can have a very powerful effect here um, in terms of bringing about moral change. He argues that civil society can draw attention to these issues and offer critical cooperation, employing legitimate means of pressure to ensure that each government carries out its proper and inalienable responsibility to preserve its country's environmental and natural resources without capitulating to spurious local or international interests. Laudato C si also supports consumer boycotts. Um, you should be able to boycott companies that um, pollute, that contribute to climate change, so that you can quote, forcing them to consider their environmental footprint and their patterns of production. Now this can be extended to the fossil fuel divestment movement. And I know a lot of Catholic groups in particular are dedicated to divesting their financial assets from fossil fuels. And already today in the world, we have $8 trillion already committed. Now there's a practical reason for why you want fossil fuel development. These are stranded assets. These are bad investments. If you're moving towards a, a decarbonized economy, then your future lies in solar and in wind and in renewable forms of energy. It does not lie in coal and oil and gas. So these are bad investments. Um, but there's also a moral case. There's an ethical case for divesting from fossil fuels uh, because we need for the good of society, we need to um, bring about this, this kind of change. So fossil fuel divestment is very important. The role of business, and this is obviously going to matter um, to you guys because um, you, you're, you're, you're involved in business. You're involved in, in business education. Um, Pope Francis has says that business is actually a noble vocation if it's but under the proviso that it serves the common good. So business can be a noble vocation, but it must serve the common good. And here there's both a negative and a positive injunction. The negative injunction says 
do not pollute, do not contribute to climate change, uh, do not pillage the earth, um, do not do all this bad stuff. Uh, and as he, he says, that economic and social costs of using up shared environmental resources must be recognized with transparency and fully borne by those who incur them, not by other peoples or future generations. And here's the punchline. He argues that only when this happens is business activity considered ethical. So the question to keep in your mind is how much business activity today, according to Laudato Si, will be considered unethical because it's not serving the common good, because it's not doing what it should to protect the environment. It's not paying for the shared environmental resources that it uses. But there's also a positive injunction that business should use its creativity and its ingenuity and its innovation to invest in longer term sustainable development, invest in like the future, not just focusing on short term profit, but instead on longer term economic value. And you all as business students are well aware of these debates, the old Milton Friedman standard that the goal of business is simply to maximize shareholder value versus this different standard that you're responsible to a wider array of stakeholders, including society as a whole, including um, the environment, uh, and including in modern parlance uh, to the sustainable development goals. Business must rally around the sustainable development goals because, you know, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're government or whether you're business, whether you're public sector or private sector, uh, the whole of society needs to be involved in sustainable development. And Pope Francis actually argues that in his view, in his optimistic view, there's no real conflict between making money and investing in sustainable development. He says efforts to promote a sustainable use of natural resources are not a waste of money. Rather, efforts to promote a sustainable, sorry, more diversified and innovative forms of production, which impact less on the environment, can prove very profitable. So that's the role of business. Uh, it's a positive role. Um, that is my lecture on Laudato Si. I told you it was going to be a short one, but that's okay since we're technically outside the term time. Um, you will not be tested on this next Tuesday um, because we're outside the term time and that just wouldn't be fair. And there's a lot of people who couldn't make class today. Um, but uh, it's uh, 10.47. We can finish here or we can have a discussion. Do you have any questions uh, about anything we've talked about? Or I have a quick question about the final. Yeah. Um, since there will be uh, five essay questions, three yeah. of which we need to write about. Yeah. Uh, will there be any calculations? Uh, because I, I remember two or three lectures uh, that we, there were some calculations involved. And I know you said we don't need to remember all the, uh, like all the calculus and whatever, but there will be no, calculations in the text, correct? Correct. It'll just be five essays. Okay. It'll be very different. The, the, fi the final, is, it's going to be different from the midterm. The midterm was based on kind of the first half of the semester, which was a little on the more technical side. The, the, the final is based more on the second half of the semester, which I think lends itself more to essay style questions. There are some technical stuff, but you don't really need to worry about that. I mean, obviously, if the essay is on a technical subject, you write about that, but you don't have to put any algebra or math in your essay answer. Um, for a start, you only have 14, you only have uh, 40 minutes per question. So we're not going to, you're not going to have time to be writing equations and solving math problems in that. So no, it's just, a, it's, it's essays. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
Professor, I was wondering if you were going to post the recordings from the lectures. I was looking on Blackboard last night when I was reviewing um, for, the, for the final, and I wasn't able to find any. Oh, this, yeah, I thought they were. Alexi, do you know the answer to that? Yeah, they should all be on Blackboard. under uh, They're, they're under uh, the Panop Panopto Video Library uh, tab on the side. So oh. not in like files or anything or, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. yeah if you have problems, you can always just email me. I'll, I'll put my email in the chat and that, that goes for everyone, of course. Yeah. Thank you, sorry about that. No, that's no okay. Um, that's important. We need to know about that, yeah. Um, okay, Let's, uh, let, me, let me ask you a more general question then. How was this course? Um, what did you like? What would you do? Anything you would do, we would do differently? Uh, because this is an experimental course. This is the first time it's been taught. And our goal here is to kind of replace principles of economics with a new way of teaching economics. Um, do we do that? Do we miss certain subjects? Do we skip things? Do we, do, do we cover subjects that you don't think um, are were too important or any feedback? Or you can email me privately if you don't want to mention this publicly. But uh, we would, Professor Sachs and I would like to get some feedback um, on. I, I have a couple of comments. Yeah, um, go Barbara. I thought, I thought it was absolutely great the way you pointed out that Pareto uh, optimality depends on the assumption of perfect competition. Yeah. Uh, but I think it would be even better if you estimated even or emphasized even more how little perfect competition exists in the world. I mean, my whole career has basically been modeling a theoretically perfectly competitive industry, which is garbage collection. And in fact, that's not even that perfectly competitive. Mm. There really are no, I mean, the whole basic assumption of Pareto optimality is basically false. Mm -hmm. So, I yeah. mean, maybe if you want to devote a few moments to monopolistic competition or something like that. Okay. That that's, might be something. That's a good point. Yeah. I guess we could spend a little more time describing perfect competition just to show how unrealistic it actually is. Uh, yeah, I guess in the, in the, in the, in the week on where markets fail, we could do that. Let me, let me write some notes to myself. Okay. Any other questions, any other feedback? Yeah. Um, I, oops, I got lots of it. Um, I'd like to do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, when everybody's left with you about a whole bunch of topics that came up from this particular session. But I've taught for so many decades that I have a lot of ideas about the course, which I think is a delightful thing for me to be involved in. I've enjoyed it immensely. And I think you've really got something very, very solid here. Uh, I've suggested one one of the suggestions was in the domain of tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them from the military. And I think that Jeff's last, uh, um, last lecture might be the first part of the course. Uh, mm. and now I'm not so sure if maybe your lecture shouldn't also be the first part of the course and both at the end of the course. Um, uh, I'd like, when everybody's gone, like to do some one-on-ones with you about possible things that may come out of today's lecture. Sure. Um, but um, I think uh, we, we really need to transform what we teach in economics. And um, the leverage, I think, is this Jesuit initiative for the new paradigm for inspired Jesuit business education, which I think is to inspire all business education. The, uh, the great thing about the course, though, is you've got it all on video. Yeah, everything's recorded. Every, yeah. all, all available. So I think it's a matter of getting a team together and uh, doing your version two of the course for teaching in the fall. Um, and, um, and I think you've got a great start on that. You could, you could have a successful course just doing exactly what you've done with no changes at all. But I also think there's some real opportunities to take it to the next level. But for a first stab at what you're doing, uh, I think it's a complete success. You ought to feel very, very good about what you all have done. Okay, thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. I I agree with with what Jim just said. I think what I would add is, um, and I'm thinking back to this table at the very beginning where uh, there were all the sort of traditional neoclassical economic concepts, and then all the um, 
sort of opposing concepts right next to it. Um, mm. And I think um, if, if this course is to replace um, sort of economic uh, education in general, I think there may need to be more of that sort of paralleling sort of between concepts mm. um, because I think, I think that, I mean, if you just look at the, all the textbooks, ManQ and all the econ textbooks, they all look the same. They all have the same concepts, the introductory ones. And I'm mm-hmm. thinking, I'm thinking we have, you have all of this very old uh, sort of traditional, um, uh, all of the traditional concepts and then you have this very sort of new um, kind of, I guess, hard to, hard to admit that that is sort of the future concepts. And I think there needs to be a middle ground, something to, to connect them if you would like to introduce this into economic um, education in the future. So like um, if, if we could actually sort of open a textbook, open our, our, the textbook that we use in basic micro and then open a page and then read what's going on there and then like sort of get the arguments against it um, like that would be that would be great. That would sort of change your mind about what you have learned already. That's very thank you. I, That's a good yeah, good insight. I think that like what Alexios was saying, it's kind of you need a bridge um, to kind of translate the you know the older teachings of economics and tie that better together to these new ideas. Um, and I also wanted to say that I think even just having this class in person will open it up to a lot more conversation oh. participation from students, which is obviously harder to do on Zoom with everyone trying to you know, speak over one another. It's a little awkward. Um, but generally, yeah. I think that the course was really interesting and um, a, lot, you know, a lot of great new ideas to finish off oh. my time at Fordham. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I, no, I think I've mentioned this before. I hate teaching on Zoom. I think this is a wholly artificial and unnatural way of communicating um i don't like it because you can't you can't get the interaction you normally get when teaching you can't get feedback from students like you said you're staring at when i'm teaching i'm staring at my powerpoint i don't see any of you so i don't see any of your reactions whereas in a real classroom you'd get instantaneous feedback you'd have discussion so I miss all of that. So I would very much like to teach this in person. I don't know whether it'll be in the fall or next spring and that's up to the Gabelli school. Um, yeah, but that's, um, so what I'm hearing from both Juliana and Alexi is that we need a, a better bridge to, uh, to show you how we're getting from the old model to the new model. Uh, that's a, that's a good point. And when we write the textbook, oh, def, we're going, the next step is actually to, to do the textbook. We will be using the transcripts of the course of the classes as the first draft of the textbook, which is because uh, it's better to start with something on paper than a blank page, uh, as you can imagine. So that's how we're going to, that's how we're going to do it. Let me come back to what Alexia said and what uh, Julie just said. Um, I look at this course as one of the forerunners of the transformation of all of business education, particularly the core course, which is James and I are working on pretty actively. And everyone, marketing, finance, management, everything. Uh, I don't know what the right approach is, and I think we should take a bunch of approaches to bringing about this transformation. But one of them I think may be promising is to start each of those courses, finance, marketing, economics, was something along the lines of, this is what we taught your boss and your parents. And we ain't teaching that anymore. This is what we're gonna teach you. So recognize that we've seeded in the business education system and economics, we've seeded a whole mindset and set of principles that we now know don't work. And the courses we now are going to teach you in each of those fields, each field is going to be what is now appropriate for the 21st century and not for the 19th and 20th century. Yeah. And and that may be the first chapter. It may be a table or two. Maybe Alexis might point out uh, but a couple of key things that are going to be different. That may be one of the approaches that will work. 
and uh, and I'll say some more when when we do one on ones, which I'd like to do today if we can, since I have you at the moment, <laughs> and, and I know you're busy and hard to get hold of. Not as hard as some people to get hold of. Uh, so that that was my current thought on on, um, on on what you're doing and what everybody needs to do: finance, marketing, etc. Okay, very useful. Thanks, Jim. Maybe maybe I, I can. Would... I'll go. Go ahead. I would chime in. Um, Ten years ago, I took um, price theory as as a core course requirement at the Gabelli School um, with Professor Mancu's um, coursework, and it was taught in such a way as to render it really not incredibly useful in my business career. Whereas I, as much as I agree with Alexi and and Juliana and everyone that some we're in transition economically speaking right now um from a place of of a very sort of libertarian view to getting back to a more communal view i found your coursework much more useful for my day-to-day work so i I wouldn't change a thing (laughs) (laughs) thank you james uh that's uh i'd like to hear that but that was you know when i talked to jeff at the very beginning when we planned this course, you know, what was very clear in his mind is, you know, because he was talking about his daughter had went, took an economics course at Yale and basically says, you know, this is not what I need to know about the, what do I need to know about the economy today? And the way, what you're taught in a standard kind of principles course is very little about what you need to know. How does the economy operate? What are the key, the big debate? What are the big issues? So, you know, one thing we really try to do is to ask the question, if you are starting from economics, uh, having never taken an economics course before, what do you need to know? And the answer is not how to draw an indifference curve. Uh, it is, you know, what are the important issues? What are the philosophical backgrounds? What are the, what are the ethical concepts that often get, that get submerged and buried? Uh, and ignored in traditional economics courses. Yeah. I, I did some good work in economics at MIT on backward bending and difference curves oh, in God. the good old days. And it was purely, purely irrelevant to anything. Yeah. Totally yeah. irrelevant. <laughs> your, okay. your, uh, your course reminds me, and James's course reminds me of um, the, the degenerative nature of where we are right now in this course and all the transformation business education, we're really talking about bringing about deep change. And I'm reminded of a poem that goes something along the lines of, the measure of a poem is not the rhythm and the rhyming and the something or other of it. It's whether or not it inspires somebody else to write a new poem or somebody to write his first poem, something along that line. Uh, is, is that and it's what I think this course is in addition to agreeing with James it's really really been great but it's how it's going to inspire this whole transformation of all as a model of all um, the business education courses that we have <coughs> which are doing the work of the devil right now yeah and, and that uh, what you've done uh, really should be very visible and very out front uh, not so everybody, so people can follow your path identically with no creativity and people can take entirely different paths with a lot of creativity because we don't know the answer to what we're doing. It's not just changing the business processes. It's changing ourselves as human beings. We have to be different yeah. people. Right. We have to have a different society. We have a different economic system. Everything has to change. Right. That means a lot of groping and exploration. That's what research is about. You know, if we knew what we're doing, we wouldn't call it research. Right. Yeah. Right. Very, yeah. Yeah, I agreed. So very and well. to that end, a huge, a huge thank you to you and Professor Sachs for an oh. amazing class. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that, James. We certainly had, um, I really, as I mentioned in the, in the email I sent to the students, I I've, I was pr- <laughs> privileged to teach this course. I really enjoyed it. The time went by so quickly. Um, I, you know, despite the problems of being on Zoom, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and 
my main regret is that I have not had a chance to meet any of you in person. I feel like I know you from 14 weeks on Zoom, but we've never met in person. So that's, you know, we, 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 we teach in our course about the importance of human relationships and community, but we don't really have it. We never managed to form a real community, unfortunately. But you know, um, you know, Tony, I, I feel your pain about not one-to-one -one traditional teaching contact, et cetera. But I want to remind us that we now have about one year of widespread experience teaching in Zoom. And we have 3,000 years or 2,000 years of teaching one-to-one -one in classroom. And I, I don't share your pessimism or pain about when I, I regret that I didn't teach, couldn't teach this term in Zoom. I am convinced that we are going to be able to do stuff with Zoom and its manifestations that are more powerful than we could do one-on-one. And that we'll find, I, I feel very connected to you and some of the other people in the class. And I know that I could Google Julianne and say, can we talk for 20 minutes after class about what happened? And we could do that. Yeah. And we're going to figure out how to do that. And we're going to figure out how easily when we have breakout rooms in Zoom that we can actually capture every breakout room and go back to it later if we want to. And, and we're just barely at the cutting edge of this technology. And, um, and now we've got millions of people involved in it. And we're going to learn. Um, and 